Good morning. It's uh, March the 3rd, uh, 2016, and I'm sitting here in the birches in Camp Dakota. It was four degrees this morning outside when I woke up at home in Walpole. It's warming up a little bit with the sun shining brightly here at Camp Dakota. And I think I'll take my hat off for a little bit. Uh, there used to be some hair up there. And my name is Bill Allen, and uh, at Camp Dakota I was Uncle Rusty. And I served the Cheshire County YMCA for 18 years in many different roles between 1971 and 1990. Camp Director Fred Chute brought me here as an associate in the Y in 1971. My first summer at Dakota was 1972. And from 1985 to 1989, I was the Administrative Camp Director along with Buffalo Bob Smith and uh, Bruce Holloway, two of my great friends uh, who served as the program directors. The more I became involved with camp, the more I realized that Camp Dakota is a very special place. Uncle Jeff Craig, and you may have already seen his video, described camp best when he called it a growth development center. I remember the days he proclaimed that and I've never forgotten those words. Jeff was so right that Camp Dakota is a growth development center. Many committed personalities are responsible for Dakota's success. And one of those I'd hoped to have joined me today, and up until this morning, I thought that she was gonna be able to come, be in here in the Birches, but actually it's too cold for her to be here today. And if you registered for Camp Dakota between 1946 in 1970, 1993, Martha Fisher would have registered you. And in Marty's day, early bird registration was a big deal. You had to hand carry your registration to 40 School Street in Keene, the Y office, or make sure that it was postmarked on Valentine's Day, February 14th, to be an early bird camper. And if you were an early bird camper, you were entitled to have an ice cream sundae on the first night of camp. That was a big deal. But if you were coming back for your second or more years and all of your previous camp cabin mates enrolled as early birds, all of your cabin, together with Aunt Francis and Uncle Oscar, would go off campus to the Black Lantern restaurant in Keene and have a fried chicken supper. Big deal in those days to get off campus and into Keene to the Black Lantern. Marty's a special lady. She graduated high school on a Friday night in June of 1946. And the following Monday morning, she reported to Uncle Oscar Elwell in Camp Dakota. And Marty's only job in her entire career was to serve Camp Dakota. She retired April 1, 1993, after 48 years, and proudly wears her official CT-48, but she has CTs into the early 50s, 51, 52, 53, because Uncle Jeff recognized her for all her volunteer work in retirement. And Marty and Sally, and my dear friend, my trusted co colleague here at Camp Dakota, she served five decades with Uncle Oscar Elwell, Fred Two. Jeff Craig and myself in our administrative uh, 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 center here at Camp Dakota is named for Marty Fisher as the Fisher Administration Center. I wanted to talk about her. I hoped she'd be here, but she wasn't able to join us today. It's just too cold. And now we have company uh, here in the birches at Camp Dakota uh, with a toasty fireplace behind me. Uh, a little promotion for a special gathering that's coming uh, of Dakota alumni this summer. And I wanted you to meet Sarah Cunningham, who's our registrar. And on Friday, uh, August 26th, through Sunday, August 28th of this year, the centennial celebration of friendship and memories for Camp Dakota's first 100 years will be held here at Camp Dakota in Richmond, New Hampshire. You may register online or you can call Sarah Cunningham at New Hampshire 603-352-0447 and I'll repeat that at the end uh, so that if you want to get a piece of paper uh, to write it down 
because now the time to serve uh, your papers and get registered for Camp Dakota's reunion. I wanted you to put a face to a name and meet Sarah Cunningham. You'll see Sarah again at the end when we give that information out. I'm going to take my hat off and see if I can stand it with the, with the coldness here, but the fireplace will keep me warm. Today, Ryan Reed now serves as the director of Camp Dakota, and Artie Lang is the Cheshire YMCA's executive director. And Ryan and Artie and Sarah, along with current day Dakota staff, look forward to welcoming you home to your Camp Dakota uh, in Richmond, New Hampshire. And if you are seeing this video today uh, of historic personalities, you have tuned into the site and we want to give you an opportunity to learn a little bit about some of those people who have made the Dakota experience viable over the years. The Dakota experience uh, was something that happened during your youth. It helped mold your personality. It focused your character development your values of fair play, your moral code for a positive life. Camp Dakota may have been your first time away from home, or Camp Dakota's leadership training programs may have taught the skills that enhance your staff relationships in your chosen careers. Many long-term Dakota personalities, and I want to stress that long-term because that's so unique to the Cheshire YMCA, Camp Dakota, and our history. Many of those long-term personalities are passionate, and that's an understatement, passionate and have poured the foundation blocks for your Dakota experience. And as Dakotians will gather this year to celebrate the first hundred years, I want to reflect on and salute some of those personalities, tell you a little bit about them. Depending on where you fall in the scheme of the last hundred years, uh, you may either heard of some of them, know some of them, met some of them, and I can reflect back from the first years up to the 75th year, uh, and others will do it as you get closer in. We can't do it without mentioning Uncle Oscar Elwell and Aunt Frances Elwell. Arrived in camp in the fall of 1921 and led Camp Dakota for a half a century from 1921 to 1970, 50 years. And outside of the craft shop here at Camp Dakota still stands a statue with a sundial. And the sundial says, remembering only the warm days of life and celebrates a century of combined service to youth. Uh, for the Elwells. Oscar was not Camp Dakota's first camp director. Howard T. Ball, Daniel Lorenz, and Victor Smith each led this YMCA's camping program for short periods of time before, before World War I. And I shared a special relationship with Oscar until his death in February of 1986. During the Elwell era of 50 years, Camp Dakota became, developed, and flourished. Along with the professionals that serve this camp, there are many, many important lay volunteer board members who made the same kind of contributions, and one of them was Harold J. Dickinson. Harold J. Dickinson served on the board of directors for 68 consecutive years. He was a founder. He was there at the first meeting, December 13th, December 8, 1913, when it was organized and served from 1913 to 1981 for 65 consecutive years. In 1915, Harold, along with three other board members, Robert Woodward from Dublin, Elgin Jones from Marlow, and Henry Smith, Henry Brown from West Swansea, formed a committee to locate a permanent site for this YMCA's camping programs. And in August of 1916, Camp Dakota's first 60 acres were purchased for $2,200. Think of that, 60 acres, $2,200, they raised a thousand, therefore they had a debt of 1,200, and the next year they arranged with the local power company, the Keen Electric and Gas Company, to buy the cedar trees that were abundantly available for telephone poles. 
and they raised $1,500, paid off the $1,200 debt, and had $300 for future expansion, and were debt-free because of that committee. Harold Dickinson did an outstanding job for us. And the rest is history, of course. I mentioned Elgin Jones was on that same committee. He was a board member from Marlowe, and he named the new camping programs Camp Dakota. Elgin was a Dartmouth College graduate, had Sioux Indian friends at Dartmouth, and visited those Sioux Indian friends uh, in South Dakota after his graduation. He was drawn to the name Dakota, and he took the D and the T of Dakota and swapped them from Dakota to Dakota and added an H on the end just for the heck of it. And therefore, the name of Camp Dakota emerged. And Elgin, feeling a special kinship of friendship with the Sioux Indians out there, established Dakota's motto as friendly to all. And that fireplace is not being as friendly to me. And to keep my feet warm, we're going to put my hat back on here for a few minutes. Many of the board members invested decades of service to the YMCA. And Henry Brown, part of the committee that found the property, served on the finding committee. And Henry's Brown family have been involved with this YMCA for an unbroken string of one hundred consecutive years of involvement. Henry's son Gordon, who I knew personally as a past president in 65 to 67, served 39 years on the board. Henry's grandson Doug, who brought me here, chaired the personnel committee when Fred Toot was the camp director and executive director. Henry's grandsons Doug, Derek, Digby, and Duncan and granddaughters Jane and Ann were all Dakota campers in the 40s. Henry's great-grandson, Douglas, is a past president, 2010 to 2013, still serves on the Y board, and Henry's great-great-grandson, Tucker, is still a Dakota camper. Five generations of Brown family over a hundred years. I'll bet there's not another YMCA camp or organizational camp in America today that has that kind of a family history showing the depths and roots of this organization. Camp Dakota is a very special place to many, many alumni. They stay involved and their children return year after year. And there are more historic personalities as laymen. Board members like George K. Ripley of Troy, president of Troy Mills, served 55 years as an incorporator and board member, 1927 to 1982, and during the post-depression era, World War II era, and up until uh, more recent days, served 30 consecutive years till 1953 during the Korean War era as the president of the board. And he is the only other person that I know of in the history of the camp that ever got the title uncle because of his work at camp and his commitment and his special friendship and tributes to Oscar. And he, by the way, bought the first movie camera and loved to run around camp taking movies with and for Oscar Elwa. On Tuesday of this week, Marty Fisher and I went to uh, Laconia, New Hampshire and took Charlie Plimpton out to lunch. Charlie and Lois Plimpton uh, have CT10. Charlie's 92 years young and was Oscar's first full-time year-round assistant director between 1952 and 1961 and lives in Laconia, is in good health. Lois has passed, but as I left and he shook my hand and thanked me for lunch and coming, he said, keep smiling, Bill. That was Charlie's motto, keep smiling. Elsie Crowning Shield, for those of you who, who camped here between 1935 and 1970 would remember Elsie. Fall, winter, and spring she cooked at Northfield School for Girls. Summer she cooked at Camp Dakota. And she was truly the command sergeant major of the kitchen. It was Elsie's way or no way. And if she would come in at night and find a pot handle in the wrong direction 
or the handle on a cup facing in the wrong direction. You paid the price next the next day, but people loved her. She was disciplined, she was your friend, you worked hard for her, and she is a legend. She lived to be 102 years old. I used to visit her at the Gill Oddfellows home up in Ludlow, Vermont, and she loved to have Dakota visitors in those years. Fred and Jan too came to the Cheshire County YMCA from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where Fred was directing Camp Westwood, and we're our directors at Camp Dakota and Fred the Executive Director, 1971 to 1977. And it's important to note in those very delicate and difficult transition years between the Elwell era and heading toward the 21st century, that it was Fred Toot that focused Camp Dakota's transition years and got us in a direction of stability for the future. Example, in those days there was one week boys, four week boys, four week girls, one week girls. And Fred looked at the finances and the reality and the registration and said, people just can't afford four weeks of coming to camp. So he took the four weeks and divided it into two two-week sessions, eliminated the one-weekers, concentrated on that, and built a stable kind of an operating mechanism which works even unto today. And that's the kind of focus that transition needed and Fred to my friend, who brought me here, we were both camp directors in Rhode Island, uh, provided for this camp. Old timers would remember Margaret and Freddie Mitchell from Keene between the 1935 and 1970. Margaret wears a CT 38 and a half. And on her retirement day, she got a vase of 38 red roses and one half, meaning the stem was cut, for her boutonniere to wear that day of celebration. Margaret was the office secretary during the war years. Freddie was off the war, came back, and every spring, Freddie Mitchell opened every building in Camp Dakota, made sure the doors worked, the springs worked, the steps were fixed, the, the uh, screens were fixed. He opened camp in its entirety, except the Amarosas put on the water, and every year Freddie came and put camp to bed as a volunteer. And about six, eight years ago, he got one of the first Foundation Stone Awards uh, at annual meeting for his work laying the foundation for the future toward the 21st century. Jeff and Karen Craig. Uh, Jeff was with me this morning when uh, he and Marty and I had breakfast and Marty said she just couldn't come, but I brought Ke Fred, uh, she, excuse me, I Fred brought Jeff here from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1978. He served from 1978 to 1983 as the director of Camp Dakota, and then he returned as executive director in Camp Dakota between 1990 uh, to the end of his YMCA career in 2006. And uh, he went on to, uh, between then, went on to run the camp of the uh, Philadelphia YMCA and then went to Connecticut and ran Camp High Rock in Mohawk, getting some diversity and other ideas and came back and fulfilled his career here. And you can see his video also online, getting ready for the centennial. Another person that I brought here in 1987 who is currently the longest tenured serving Tacodian on the staff is the beloved Chef Dean Lafayette. And Chef Lafayette was here, or is here from 1987 until this year, 2016. This summer he will get CT30. And my understanding in talking with him last week is that he will retire at the end of this summer and go into the legend book along with Elsie's crowning shield and Mary and John Cowling and Chef Cardine, the longest tenured chefs over the history of camp. Another person you may have uh, seen her uh, video is uh, the beloved Joan McNeil Bird, CT26, came here at age 11 as a camper in 1946 and was a leader she was a, a cabin a leader, she was assistant waterfront director, and then she took time off to go raise her family, 
and then she returned in 1985 and spent 14 years in minicamp. In minicamp was her thing. The, one of the best things I ever did in minicamp was asking Joan to serve as the program director and I just stood out of the way and let her go. She and her crew would prepare 51 weeks to come for one week at camp and they were something else. And minicamp was one of my special things. Uh, I went, one of the things I got closest to in running and I get a big smile about the fact that during those days uh, there was question about us invading Camp Dakota with this mini camp thing and we took some heat over that and some of the staff who were the biggest questioners of that came back in latter years and became the biggest proponents and volunteer leaders in mini camp in the latter years. So I take a great deal of pride in mini camp. And with a, with a sigh of sadness but with great pride, I mentioned Buffalo Bob Smith. Bob Smith came to us from Springfield College with mold still behind his ears. He was a great spirit. He moved from uh, the associate director uh, for program, uh, assistant director of camp, associate director of camp, was here from 1976 to 1985. And uh, Bob wrote the, the song, the hymn, Wicker Armchair wicker armchairs that we sit in here at camp and Bob rests eternally behind the altar uh, in Elwell Chapel. My dear friend, a Springfield College colleague and uh, CT10 and a sad day when we had to lay Bob to rest. Following Bob Smith came Bruce Holloway, CT13. He came as a leader, never was a staff person, uh, in the 70s and 80s and in between 1987 and 1992 was the Associate Camp Director for Program Services un under Uncle Jeff and in 1993 he was the Director of Camp Dakota and in my opinion uh, up until those days Bruce Holloway was the most creative Program Director that Camp Dakota ever had he had the arts and the crafts, he had the spirit, he had a special smile of inclusiveness, and he was wonderful. Today he teaches science and has for 17 years at Brattleville, Vermont High School. Following Bruce came Mike and Gretchen Hafer. Mike was a camper in the 70s, Mike and Gretchen were staff in the 80s. Uh, Gretchen was the waterfront director 1991 to 1999. Uh, she has 13 years in. Mike is a CT21 and from 1994 to 1998 was, uh, was let me get this straight, was the camp director under Uncle Jeff Craig. Willie Therian, 30 years. He was a camper. He was a leader under my time. He stayed on. He came back. He was the director of the camp for 13 consecutive years from 1999 to 2013. He's now at the Stonely High School in Greenfield, Massachusetts and lives in Marlboro, New Hampshire and is one of the few people in the history of this camp that got a CT30 jacket. And Mike and Bruce and Willie and Bob were all on my staffs, some of them as, sometimes as campers, as leaders, as an employees and went on to give great leadership to Camp Dakota. And I'm real proud of that because my theme at camp was to grow up the next level of leadership behind you. And then there was another very special man here. If you said his name was Ken, most people wouldn't know who he was. But if you blurted out Kingfish, you knew who Ken Kingfish Clapter was. 1974 to 1990, CT-17 and his beloved Camp Dakota. Not only served for, for those uh, 17 years as waterfront director, but during my time, I positioned him in the role of assistant camp director for ceremonies, candlelight, and chapel. For he brought the maturity to the camp and led a foundation of excellence and was a great source of energy and help to me in focusing and running Camp Dakota in the decentralized staff team way of, of those years. Another one of those special personalities 
is a fellow your name is Jose. You probably didn't know much more. If you know much, you might call it Jose Noriega. If you wanted to do it right, Jose Antonio Gutierrez Noriega Perez Priya came to us from uh, Mexico City as an international program specialist, has a CT10, did a wonderful job for us, and today I'm proud to tell you that Jose is the director of Club España in Mexico City in their outdoor center where he has his Spanish Camp Dakota. He does an incredible job. I talk with him often, I see him about every year or two, and he is my dear and cherished friend from Mexico City. Another person that the LIT community would have known in the late 1980s and early 90s was John Otash. And John Otash I knew for years from a distance, and then when we laid Bob Smith to, to rest, he stood next to me as we interred Bob, and he said to me, can I come back and be on your staff? Now, John was a 35 to 40 year old guy then. And I said, what do you say? He said, I was Bob Smith's LIT director at YMCA Camp Lincoln when he was a teenager. And I have with me in my pocket, my staff shirt for the LITs that summer. I wonder if I can lay it with him, absolutely. Long and the short of the story, John Otash came to Camp Dakota at the midlife area. He was a school teacher in, in um, New Hampshire over in Newmarket, and he came and spent five to six years as our director of leadership training. What strength and stability he led to camp. Another special personality, Manuel Salundo from Mexico City, CT35. I believe it was either 10 or 13 of those in camp as a leader, an international camp leader, and his theme song was The Music Concert. And if you knew Manuel in those days, and I still think it pops out in, in family camp, he dances and prances around the dining hall playing the instruments and singing This Is The Music Concert. And Manuel, when his oldest daughter was two months old, brought his family to Camp Dakota and for 25 consecutive years has now come to family camp that oldest daughter is now an accountant in Mexico City, and the youngest daughter keeps coming with him, and this is his respite from the world. He works with Trice Waterhouse in Mexico City and has returned to family camp for 25 years. And I would like to begin to end this list with another volunteer. I always keep going back to the volunteers and the board members because they run Camp Dakota. They sponsor it. They support it. They gave the leadership to it. And F. Fuller Ripley, better known as Fuller Ripley, CT6, was here in 1922 on Oscar Elwell's first summer directing camp. And Fuller Ripley was one of his campers from 1922 to 1926, returned later as a leader. Went on in life, joined the family business of Troy Mills in, in Troy, New Hampshire, and as an adult and community leader, Fuller joined the Y Board in 1946, served five decades, and was the Renaissance president for that transition from the Elwell era into the 21st century, serving as president from 1986 to 1971. He was the president who brought me here to Camp, Camp Dakota in the Cheshire County Y. Fuller's son, Barry, then went on and served as our board president, 1984 to 87. Fuller's grandchildren, Heidi and Rosemary and Andrew, were all campers and leaders, and I remember them in camp. And the Ripley family has served Camp Dakota for 85 years. The Browns and the Ripleys are just incredible with their service to this camp. And every camp director, in every time period, recalls many special personalities during their era. I knew all these Dakotians that I mentioned. I'm not name dropping. I met with them, I've worked with them, I've worked for them, I have spent time with them and I knew them all. And I feel honored to have worked with them and for them. And I felt that their pa I felt their passion for Camp Dakota and witnessed their legacies and contributions. These are about a few of literally hundreds and thousands of Dakotians 
who have visited the shores of Cass Pond, Dakota Lake, over the first 100 years. My time at camp ended over a quarter century ago. And when I walked in the door of the Birches this morning to sit in this chair in front of this fireplace, it's the first time in 27 years that I've gone through that door and come here since I left in 1989. So I left in 1989. There's been another quarter of a century that has elapsed from there, and I have to leave more current administrations uh, to talk about those personalities, and I hope that they'll, they'll do that in the same way so people can recall these people. On a personal note, I love managing Camp Dakota. I love witnessing campers and watching staff grow. Camp Dakota, as Jeff Craig said, is a growth development center. That's what we are, and that's what we do well. I cherish memories of my Dakota years and our staff teams. And the word team was what staffing was all about to me. It's not just a word, it's not just a terminology. It was my focus of what our job was to be. And I preached the gospel that it was senior staff's role to train up the staff members who served under them to carry on our jobs and responsibilities into the next era. And when I talk about Bruce Holloway carrying on, and Mike Hafer carrying on, and Willie Therrien carrying on. They were campers and staff under me who moved on into the roles of being the director of Camp Dakota. Those are amongst my most cherished memories of this camp and what it provides as a special place and training experience. And though my days here too soon came to an end, I am now content to sit in my wicker round chair and sit back and remember the times that we shared. Our candles so brightly burned and I know that my grandchildren, Cutler and Grayson, are all signed up to come to Camp Dakota this summer as third generation Dakotians. And I brought back Sarah so that you can put a face to a process to remind you, as I said I would at the beginning, of registering for our centennial Friday, August the 26th, till Sunday, August the 28th, this year, 2016, the centennial celebration of friendship and memories for Camp Dakota's first 100 years. Lots more to come. It's going to be held here at Camp Dakota. I promise it be warmer. I'll take my hat so you can see what's left of Uncle Rusty, maybe Uncle Baldy, and keep my hat off. Or maybe I'll don a Dakota hat at that time. And remember that you can register to come online, that new modern process that old guys like me don't really get comfortable with. Or you can simply pick up the phone and call the Cheshire YMCA in Swansea, New Hampshire, actually I think it registered as a P.O. Box in Keene, and ask for Sarah Cunningham. The number is 603-352-0447. Return home to your Camp Dakota this summer and rekindle some friendships and memories and be with your friends. And in closing, Allow me to share our candlelight prayer spoken by camp directors at every candlelight service since the early 1920s. Oscar Elwell brought this prayer and began the tradition in 1922 when he directed his first camp. He came September 1, 1921, directed his first camp in 1922. As we light our candles, we share our dreams. With each new flame, new visions gleam. And in the purifying light, our spirits reach a fairer height. And in our hearts, we breathe this prayer. God, 
blessed Dakotians everywhere.